Welcome back, everybody. How's it going? Wandering into wellness here, as usual, Lydia and Finn. And today we have a really special guest, an old school pal of mine, Megan Hine, who is a survivalist and a TV producer. And I'm so excited. I have wanted this podcast mm-hmm. for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God. Well, you've been talking about it for literally years. I think. Literally yeah. years. <laughs> um, so, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, we were just saying, I, I wonder how long it's been since <laughs> since we actually saw each other last. It's been a, been a long time, but so it's really nice to reconnect. I know. Yeah. And I remember I have this really vivid memory of my son is a really big Bear Grylls fan. He's eight now. And we were sitting watching a Bear Grylls show. And suddenly you popped up on the show and they were like, you know, I'm spoiler sex, but Megan Hart. I was like, what? Oh, uh, what? what? <laughs> I'm going to school with her. And then going afterwards and finding you on Instagram and seeing all the stuff you've done. And I instantly rang another friend of ours who had been the same year as us at school, um, Delara. And I was like, D- we've done nothing with our lives. <laughs> so much That's stuff. not true. <laughs> it was so funny. The two of us, I was like, it really feels like now. And just mm. people usually say to me, like when they meet me, gosh, you've done so much stuff. Like you've traveled so many places. Mm. And like, how have you done all that stuff in your life? And I was like, Trump. no. <laughs> I just looked at your feet. I was like, God, I feel like I need to like superpower my life yeah. now. Because it's amazing. I mean, the stuff, when I think back to school, and who we were then and you going off like I said and doing your army thing and just thinking of the trajectory that you've taken to come to now and it's so I mean it's amazingly inspiring it's always inspiring to see stories like yours of people who've reached a kind of a peak in their field and have done amazing feats but when you've known them in your teenage years as well it's kind of a more amazing thing because you realize like we both had or all of us in the school had the potential to do things like Mm. that and it's such a fascinating thing for me to see who has done those things versus who hasn't Mm. and who has chosen to versus who hasn't chosen to you know I'd be really interested to kind of start back there really in those kind of early days and say what was the thing in you like when was the first memory in you that made you decide to go and do things that push yourselves or that didn't choose to you know watch tv with your mates but chose to go and like survive somewhere in the mountains or choose army rather than you know community service like I did (laughs) Um, I think I mean, think we were, you know, very, very fortunate um, with the, the school we went to that it, there was lots of different options there to kind of express yourself in a different way, which a lot of young people now don't necessarily have the same sort of opportunities. Um, uh, so yeah, there was the opportunity of joining the military cadets. And I think going through school, sitting in the classroom, although I always did okay academically, I'd find myself kind of sat within the four walls and I'd have this real anxiety that would start rising in me. It's like this kind of panic um, and it would often manifest itself in not so productive ways. <laughs> getting, I remember getting sent out of history classes quite a lot and <laughs> having to sit outside in the in the corridor. Um, and uh and I just I just found it really, really difficult to sit still. Um, my dad uh, was um, originally a geologist and he was a geographer. He actually taught at the school that we were at um, as well, which is why I was there. Um, and all our family holidays were to go into the mountains, go and look at rocks, get up and close and personal with these rocks, <laughs> climbing, mm-hmm. them, like looking for fossils and things. Um, and I just I hadn't realised I suppose going through because my both my parents had worked very hard to get themselves out of the situations that they grew up in to chase kind of academic careers uh, and I thought I had to follow in the footsteps I didn't realize there was other avenues um, so I think falling into like the the military cadets where suddenly I could run around and be covered in mud and it was socially acceptable and <laughs> that kind of that wild side of me could actually be expressed um, was so powerful and uh, i ends up taking um uh using as much of the kind of adventurous training opportunities that came along while we were at school as possible so I was often you know off um whitewater kayaking and climbing and winter climbing in Scotland uh, and things and that's really kind of set me on the path for 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 my journey which and I feel so incredibly blessed to have found that so at such a young age Uh, can you talk to us about because there's one specific experience you referred to in your book uh, which is, I think, is it a Spanish, a Spanish mountainside, or where is that? Where you were, you were oh. left for seven days. <laughs> yeah, so that that, was that feels seven. like a road to Damascus moment. If you're ever going to have a road to Damascus moment, yeah, so I think it's dangerous. Like, I don't think you <laughs> wouldn't be allowed to send kids to do what you did. He says, I'd like at all, right? <laughs> yeah, so there's definitely there's definitely been some very kind of very 
poignant moments in my life, which I suppose were kind of like turning points. Um, so I think the, the military cadets was definitely one of those because suddenly I was aware of the fact that, you know, there was a different career and uh, I could go down into the military route as opposed to uh, academia um, uh, or be able to combine them. And uh, yeah, and then I suppose then going and actually starting university. So I, um, I did a degree in outdoor studies, which was basically three years of climbing on a student loan. Um, cool. And that was that was the first degree. That was the first time around. And um, but and I think that was a re that was a turning point for me as well, because it was a moment where I actually met uh, very like minded people as well and kind of formed well lifelong friends, really, that, you know, that I've gone and climbed and, and things all over the world with. And, you know, when you're in that situation, you're genuinely putting your life into other people's hands. Um, that's, you know, that's a real uh, that bond never goes away. Um, and then, yeah, the next moment was when I was at university and we one of the modules that we did was called a personal response to a mountain environment. Uh, and it was about kind of exploring our relationship with nature. And uh, we were, we had spent a month, the sort of the whole of my year went down to the Picos de Europa uh, in Spain to spend a month down there. And uh, part of this module was going and spending a week up uh, on a solo trip up in the mountains. And that week, the weather was just horrendous. It was like this huge snowstorm came in the first night and um, it was just, it was really, really wild. Um, and I'd chosen not to take a tent. I just took a sleeping bag and a bivy bag uh, and an ax, uh, not that there was any wood, <laughs> um, and, uh, and like um, a canteen to be able to collect water. Um, and that was it. Uh, I didn't take any food uh, with me uh, and I didn't take a tent just to see if I could actually survive up there and what would happen. Um, and I ended up uh, <laughs> what? abnormal red flag. <laughs> um, and I ended up underneath this boulder and built myself this little wall to protect myself from the wind. And there was this tiny little mouse that would come up and it kept me company. Um, and I just had this really kind of almost like out of body experience. Um, I've only ever, ever experienced that a few times since. And it was like it was a real kind of like almost like looking in of myself uh, if you like I completely lost track of time it didn't matter I didn't have a watch I didn't know what time it was all I could uh, see was like you know the passing of the the sun when I could actually see the sun through the storm um, and then sort of my routine of going to get my water and coming back and exploring and it was like I entered this really kind of like childlike state not childish like the emotions weren't kind of running wild or anything but like this kind of childlike ex like experience of like just exploration and kind of play and um things and it was a real beautiful moment and then it was kind of I suppose off the back of that because I was keeping a journal uh while I was there uh, and it kind of reads as if I was on some crazy trip but <laughs> and now, uh, but it was obviously quite like um you know it was a real moment and I think that's something that we miss in our in our lives that a lot of indigenous peoples that you know that I've lived and worked with over the years have is that kind of coming of age ceremonies where you kind of you have these experiences um and yeah and it was, it was such a powerful moment it's interesting because it's like that disconnection from routine which is what people go on sun holidays for these days essentially just to get out of their routine which i suppose is like a half of a quarter of one percent of that experience of like oh what am i like what what is the human inside me when i'm not just defined by getting up getting the kids washed and fed getting to work but did you did you have a strong sense of self before this or was this are, are, like in terms of your exploration of your own character? Because, I mean, it feels like somebody doesn't do these things without knowing they're on a path. Like it's not something you like you say you fell into. Fall into feels like it. Do you know what I mean? Was there more architecture to it? Like, did you know what you were at? No, it's been, I don't think anyone's ever actually asked me that before. But I think it's like it's a weird feeling inside. It's like I wouldn't necessarily say I've never known like where the path's going or where the destination is there's been a few times in my life where I've like I've had a goal and I've either achieved that goal or things have taken me off on a slightly different thing but I've always felt that that I'm on a path um uh, just, just pre-covid I kind of I, I fell off that path <laughs> um but I feel like I've always been on this path and it's like there's something like that just pulls me forwards um I don't know where it's going and I think it's like you know like using an expedition um as an analogy you know over the years I've led like hundreds of expeditions to pretty remote wild corners of the world and 
you know, it doesn't always go to plan. And it's like, if you really focus on the end goal, you kind of miss out on all these incredible opportunities and the, you know, the beauty or the weirdness that kind of goes along side as well. And I kind of felt that through life as well. You know, if I'd had such a set rigid goal, um, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have had all the opportunities and incredible experiences that I've, you know, been very, very fortunate to have had throughout my, my career. <laughs> <laughs> just on the, on yeah, the goals thing yeah just the set rigid goals thing really interesting because one of the things again you describe in your book is how lo most accidents happen on the return home and yeah. how the goal itself is what keeps people in the thing can you talk to us a little bit about like how that how you see people in those situations how they are like why they come to those situations with you like why you think those goals are something they need to explore and what it is when they achieve that what changes for them or does anything change like does it actually make them different yeah it's um it's a really good question um it's i mean if you look in the media obviously there's like a lot of uh, kind of adventures quite fashionable at the moment and you know there's a lot of people going to climb everest and it's it, we have such a goal orientated culture um at the moment you know it's about summiting everest it's about getting to the south pole the north pole uh, conquering a mountain or you know whatever it is but you know the getting to the top <laughs> is one part of the journey returning back to base camp uh, is another thing and actually <clears throat> it's far more uh incredible that somebody's you know been there and come back again you know when so many explorers over the years have got lost and it's often on the descent route back down because you know they that person's whole goal you know if we take Everest for example that person who's been focusing on Everest you know it's about claiming that name it's about summiting that mountain and they haven't necessarily been thinking about the fact that they've got to come back down again um, as well so it's like their whole lives for months years pre to that moment has been focused on summiting because that in their mind is where the glory is and they've achieved that and it's like the body just releases all of this like endorphin everything kind of comes out and it's like you know the the tiredness the exhaustion has come out and it's like oh we've achieved it and the, you relax and your mind switches off and in those environments it just you cannot switch your mind off because within a few seconds particularly coming back down from Everest where of the summit where it's very easy to kind of walk off the wrong way there's fixed lines to a certain point and then you have you come off and then you re-clip on slightly further down but it's very easy to go in the wrong direction um which has happened to quite a lot of people um and coming down as well coming descending down the fixed lines when there's other people and stuff uh, it's incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. um and you need to be switched on all the way back down to to, to base camp um, and it's the same with any of these expeditions um so with with my clients on trips i try to build in as much as possible cultural experiences as well mm -hmm. so they're full immersions as opposed to going into a country to conquer something you know a lot of people are going into Everest to summit Everest they don't really care about the culture or the environment around them and I think that's incredibly sad when you know you could be using when you've got that um you know you've got that media platform in that moment where you could be talking about the culture or showcasing environmental impacts or changes at climate change or you know whatever might be happening there um while you're on that journey yeah sorry go on no, no. <laughs> so <many questions. laughs> yeah it's an interesting thing isn't it though because i've always had this natural resistance i think growing up in nepal and and living in a trekking lodge in the himalayas and seeing people come through and they were always on their way to abc circuit or you know something that was on the abc banana kind of base camp circuit so they were always going up and it was really fascinating as a child to observe different people's mentality around it like most people we're trying to get to the top as quickly as they possibly could so they weren't going okay i could do this in three weeks and stop at all the nice villages and meet all the people and stay in lodges like ours and chat they were going up and then they would stay with us on the way down because they felt like well they've done the thing mm. and there was just below where our village was was another village called pokra and it's a, a lake village and it's a stunning village around a lake which also has an amazing island in the middle that you can go and visit and you can stay on <laughs> the amount of people that would come through the lodge and we would say and did you enjoy the lake in Pokhara? And they would say, what lake? Oh my God. <laughs> because they hadn't even stopped. They would just head down. So yeah. And you would see the walkers and they would be in all mm. the gear and they would be head down walking. Yeah. And 
up here was the mountains. Mm. The whole of the Annapurnas was there and rode the end of the forest and they didn't see any of it. All they were doing was looking down at their feet and trying to get up yeah. to the top so that they could get back down and go, I've done that thing. And I think that built a real resistance in me to the idea of people who want to climb Everest. So I've, when we've had this yeah. conversation where I'm like, I just don't understand why do we have this natural impulse to like conquer nature yeah. as opposed to like understanding that we are nature and how can we immerse ourselves in nature and that feels a little bit like what you're talking about when you're going to a place with a goal in mind of like I'm going to conquer this mountain mm. we're forgetting that that mountain is one part of the whole landscape yeah. in that area mm. and if you want to experience I don't know I haven't climbed Everest, but yeah. uh, maybe if you want to experience those you're things <laughs> um, yeah. oh, if I have a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah if you want to experience those things maybe you need to like feel the understanding of the mountain mm. as part of that landscape, mm. as part of the people, as part of the geography of the thing. And the only way you can do that is by stopping in those little roadside cafes and talking to the people yeah. and trying the disgusting dried fish and <laughs> having the like tea with the ghee floating yes, in the jaw, yeah, you know, yeah, and that's, you get this like multi-layered experience then mm. versus just like, you could be doing a climb anywhere really. I mean, it's Everest, so it's the biggest one and we have that ego, but what do you think makes people miss the understanding that we are nature mm. within those trips yeah well I think I mean what you've just described there is an absolutely incredible um analogy for life uh, as well in terms of uh you know that those goals and things and the fact that you know you you've seen it firsthand of living in a, the tea house and people coming down not even noticing these huge lakes <laughs> and things around it's like we go through life in exactly the same way. You know, we're very goal orientated or very focused on one thing or the things that we think that we should have or society tells us that we should have like the car and the family and the like all of these things. And we go through life focused on those things with our heads down and not really looking around us. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like how, when was the last time that you kind of really looked around like where you, where you live, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on the school run, taking children to, to school? Like when was the last time you really looked around and noticed people and noticed the things around? It's like most of our lives are spent on autopilot. Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually partly a survival <coughs> mechanism as well. Um, you know, a survival for our ancestors, you know, as, as it's filtered into our lives now is all about conservation of energy because our ancestors never knew when they were going to need to expend huge amounts of energy to fight, flight, freeze, <laughs> uh, you know, fight for their lives or, you know, or hunt, even gathering, you know, took a huge amount of energy. So when we weren't doing things that were key to our survival, we were just chilling out and sleeping and, and things. And that's, you know, our bodies and our minds still want to do that now because we haven't really evolved to the point now where actually we don't we don't need those things anymore because we've pretty much got everything on tap um and so it takes a lot of effort and energy uh to to actually kind of look up and like really kind of look around and you know i say this to my sort of my clients when i'm sort of starting to train them up to come on an expedition it's like you know even little things like when you're walking to work or you know walking along the streets start noticing a little plants that are growing in the cracks of the pavements or listening to the birds singing and things and it's like people are like whoa I didn't even I haven't even noticed those things before and just starting to and this that's like you know that's actually like mindfulness practice um mm -hmm. and the starts of that um so you know I think the the wilderness like the outdoors like brings has so many lessons and parallels in like you know in terms of like how you know how we might feel better living our lives every day as well Big time. Yeah, it's a big lesson. I feel like we have that um, thing where, you know, they say that we're better, uh, better built for paying attention to threats because that's what's traditionally kept us alive as well. We're not well built for listening to birdsong because that's been something we did when we were sitting in reflection. You know, there was no threat around, so we don't necessarily have memories. And maybe something about this achievement thing is like that's what builds a big memory because you have a deep sense of threat, deep sense of like survival necessity. And so you're like, when you get to 75 and you're looking back at your life, you're like, what did I do? You like the the the, the autopilot thing you described. It's just a, 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 like a, a necessary part of like ignoring the things aren't that aren't threats, and then these huge things that come up that. I guess the goals have something to do with threats because they're all about overcoming something, right? At some level. But that's mm -hmm. why maybe it builds these deep memories that then we see as achievements and that's become our status-driven society or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so um, that's that's something. So um, I have a, I did my second degree actually in psychology, um, and that's okay. I spent the past um, a few years actually kind of bringing it together. Because throughout over the years, and you know, Lydia, I know you will have seen this as well from the environments that you've lived in. Is like, you know, the 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 power of adventure or nature um, as like a therapeutic application, um, and how you know people feel so much better in those environments. And you know, as you just said. Uh, like our brains are hardwired to be looking out for risk because we've developed the modern world so quickly, but our brains or a large part of our brains haven't been able to evolve quick enough. So we've got this very simply kind of trying to break it down very um, far more simple than it actually is, is our brains are kind of made up of these two kind of categories of like uh, sort of the, the, the sort of the area of um, the limbic system which is where the fight, flight, freeze response mm -hmm. kind of lives and the prefrontal cortex, which is where logic and reasoning and the human mind kind of live. Mm -hmm. um, and that limbic system is far more powerful and far quicker. And it was much, much older. Um, and it, it evolved pre-humans. It's in every animal, um, pre-language as well. Uh, and its its primary function is to keep us safe. So mm -hmm. through your, your senses, so your sight, your hearing, your sense of smell, you're constantly scanning the environment around you looking for danger <laughs> you're not looking for like happiness or joy you're looking for danger um and that's what's going on all the time and our brains are then get triggered by any kind of external threat you know and in the modern world the the brain can't differentiate it's so it's so clever but it isn't able to differentiate between you know getting a triggering email or seeing somebody's perfect life on social media or running late for a meeting um versus you know what our ancestors might have uh, had to deal with like you know being predated on by <laughs> saber-toothed tigers or bears or you know <laughs> and, but it, the, the chemical response is exactly the same but we live in a world now where it's triggered um all the time because there's so much stimulation around us um and that's where that's where we now need to kind of be, start be able to create kind of space uh in that and be able to kind of get ourselves back into the more human part of the brain where logic and reasoning and being able to talk ourselves down can actually happen yeah something we were talking about before we kind of came on the podcast like you know there's this thing with obviously post military service often people experience ptsd returning to the real world whatever and they've had to protect themselves neurologically and physically from the trauma that they're experiencing. And then this is all al allowed, but in a way that society doesn't understand and, and isn't capable of coping with, could suddenly starts to come out or and, and comes out in perverse ways, I guess, often in PTSD, particularly in that situation. What, like, do you believe that the training between, like, military style training, where they break people down psychologically in order to make them more resilient in those environments is helpful like for the rest of us like if let's say as the world is going in a bit of a weird way at the moment and if let's say all went to pot is it the case that people who've had that military training are going to be the people we want to have around or actually is it people who've just lived lives like what have you seen of those people when they come on expedition with you, you know, is it predictable as to who's going to do well and that sort of thing um yeah well I mean this is a super super deep <laughs> topic but, Sorry. Um, but it's in, uh, it's incredibly fascinating um I mean PTSD uh you know isn't just uh found in like uh, military veterans yeah, anybody who's experienced uh trauma um of any form uh as I said you know it, the mind doesn't differentiate it still reacts in the same way um dependent on whether you're being shot at versus you know you've experienced domestic abuse or just a, a build-up of emotional neglect um through your younger years and uh ptsd you know it can happen like years later as well um the military system is incredible in how it functions in terms of taking young or traditionally guys um sort of young men and as you said breaking them down and building them back up again into what is needed for uh the jobs and the roles that they are you know being that they are signing up for um and they have to have you know certain things built into them and you know it's interesting because if you look at kind of uh learning models um so when like the marine slogan of 99.9% .9 need not apply that's because 99.9% .9 of us don't fall into you know the learning 
uh categories that um you know that small percentage do uh that can actually be i don't like the word broken down but you know to put it like that it can be trained in that way like a lot of most of our minds wouldn't work in that way which is why only a very small percentile actually would be taken on uh to join the royal marine commandos um and it's really fascinating um and then because they've it's happened at such a young age obviously then coming out uh, of that and back into civilian world, particularly having experienced incredibly traumatic experiences um, and having been a very tight knit unit um, and coming out of that and not having that support network around them and the kind of the camaraderie um, is is incredibly difficult uh, for anybody kind of coming out of that. Um, and, you know, the military aren't necessarily doing enough. Um, just because they don't necessarily have the resources to be able to support that in the way that it that could be doing um, to help that transition. So I, I work actually a lot with the film work that I do. Um, there tends to be quite a lot of uh, ex-military personnel uh, and a lot of kind of ex war Marines um, that come and help work on these shows that I work on. Um, and it's always very interesting because, you know, you put them together and that teamwork you know, instantly because they've been trained to work together. They, you know, they might not like each other as on a personal level, but as soon as they come together, they work together so well. Um, so, yeah, if we do end up in an apocalyptic scenario, you know, those guys with their, their training and things will come together and they will be able to work in a way that, you know, us civilians haven't necessarily uh, learned to do. But that doesn't mean that we don't have our place in those moments as well. You know, when the, the expeditions and survival um, scenarios that I've dropped people into in wilderness environments, you never know how somebody is going to react. Uh, but, you know, we all have the potential. Every single cell in our body is resilient, is fighting for resilience, fighting for survival. Um, and it's about transferring the skills that we've learned from everyday life. Uh, into that scenario and being able to kind of improvise adapt and overcome um, and we're all capable of it um, so if we end up in an apocalyptic scenario we've all got traits <laughs> that would be very helpful for that scenario so you know don't think that you wouldn't survive <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so and talk to me about women within this scenario because mm. I think you know we often get told that women are going to be less able to be in kind of survival situations, less likely to survive the Marines, any of the kind of army situations. And you chose from a really young age, from when we were, if I think back to, I mean, the world's changed a lot since when we were kind of 17, 18. And certainly my memory of being that age was very much that, <clears throat> not so much that women had traditional roles, but still what was expected of us at 17, what we were expected to do in our downtime. You know, I didn't even fit into that and I wasn't choosing the army, but girls were spending time doing makeup and buying clothes. And I was like, you know, just, it wasn't my bag at all, but I also wasn't the next stage on of going like, and now I'm going to go do the army stuff. And you made that choice. What, what allowed you A, to make that choice and kind of, I guess, go against that kind of social culture that would have been less accepting of it, not just then, but I imagine kind of almost all the way through your mm -hmm. career, like how did you choose that and how have you found is there a lot of pushback against it? Have you had a lot of challenges being a female in the kind of environments that you found yourself in? Yeah, when when I was at school, I um, I think I guess because I'd been I had the experiences when I was very young of going into the mountains and things with my dad. Um, that it wasn't to me the outdoors wasn't gender specific um, as to you know as to who was had more right to be out there. Um, and I guess I was a bit more of a sort of a lone wolf I suppose in the fact that I just felt so at home in that environment and I needed it um I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to put that into a conscious level or be able to express that or even maybe have been aware of it on a conscious level um but I was just I was just drawn to the outdoors uh, and I think it's the freedom and um, I guess, you know, when I was, you know, I didn't have the best relationship with my mum and it was, there was a lot of pressure and, uh, you know, I guess my emotional needs weren't necessarily met uh, when I was very young. And so for me, like the outdoors was a way of being able to escape uh, initially um, mm -hmm. and to get, so I'd go out on my mountain bike and I would push myself to see how far I could go, uh, you know, how fast I could do it. Uh, and it was almost like the kind of the, 
escape if you like <laughs> to keep moving and run away and I guess I made out of a career out of <laughs> escaping and just keeping keeping moving um and it wasn't yeah I suppose a few years ago I kind of really kind of uh started exploring that um a lot more um and kind of really yeah assessing that and like you know shifting identity as well because I, we get programmed when we're children um into sort of before, while our brains are developing and that ends up being like our default programming for the rest of our lives so you know the way that we react to situations was programmed into us when we were very young so it's like if you're overreacting to a situation it's because that's the toddler <laughs> that's reacting <laughs> and it's like we don't need that anymore as adults you know we've got this whole life experience behind us but it's really difficult to get in there and actually rewire the brain but it is possible, but it's that it comes through awareness and understanding of the fact that, you know, this is just the child <laughs> reacting to the scenario here. Um, yeah. one, of the things you, one of the things you talk about in your book is how the people who tend to do best on your expeditions or the ones you've seen tend to be the ones that have more adaptability, like mental flexibility, maybe. And sometimes I'm not sometimes that I mean, that specifically is a feminine trait. Like we know that we know men are very like straight and narrow if you want to do a to b the fastest quite often ask a man but if you want to consider all options ask a woman pretty much i know that we're, we're, we're painting fairly broad brushstrokes but in terms of the masculine and feminine dynamic maybe that's applicable do you are there situations that you've been in i'm sure there's loads of situations but where you've been where you have that dynamic and you can see it playing out where your natural feminine strengths are there to as a resource which wouldn't have been there if you weren't on site yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely um, interesting. And I think we need to start looking more at like the way women learn versus and the way women function versus the way, uh, you know, men do more. Uh, because, you yeah, know, when, when I'm working with like indigenous cultures, uh, you uh, there's a very there's a very obvious difference in roles. Um, as you said, it's like, you know, women uh, tend to be doing like the small game hunting, they're foraging, they're fixing the shelters, they're looking after the children, they're functioning very much as like a social unit together. Um, whereas that, you know, the men are typically kind of going off on a sort of big game hunting. And uh, if they were warring, then they would have been ready for war. So there again, it's like that conservation of energy of like the rest of the time, you know, you see them now sitting around playing cards or drinking and, and the women are doing everything. Um, so, yeah, that that kind of the female mind is very suited to survival and to being able to kind of oversee multiple layers and to be able to see the bigger picture of situations as well. Um, and, you know, I, I see that on the expeditions that I work on as well, or when I compare myself and the way that I lead to the, the guys that, uh, that I might be working with as well. Uh, for years, because I didn't have any female role models, I would get incredibly frustrated with myself. I tend to lead more on like an emotional level, um, trying to get connect with people. Um, and that by building that rapport up, I'm then able to, you know, I suppose, <laughs> manipulate people <laughs> to do what's necessary to get them through um, incredibly challenging uh, terrains uh, and things as well. Whereas, you know, some of the guys that I work with, again, huge generalization, but a lot of the guys that I work with, it's much more, uh, you are going to do this, you're going to do this. And there isn't necessarily the same emotional um, connection. And for years, I, I was so frustrated, like that I had this real, like female <laughs> way of leading, and I'd never seen another female guide or anything. But you know, now I kind of actually see for me, I've kind of stepped into that and owned that. Um, and you know, I just I just lead in a very different way. It doesn't mean I'm not achieving the same same goals uh, as you know, my male ca counterparts. Yeah, cool. It's fascinating. Because yeah, I see it in my bees. I keep bees down the back of my garden here. And I mean, <laughs> But not, I don't even, I, I see the drones doing literally nothing. I, I know that they do literally nothing for their entire lives. Essentially, all the stores while the women nurse, forage, defend, you know, everything else. And it's fascinating to see these things carried through from one species to another. It's weird that like something as distant from us genetically as that is having the same experience of nature as, as we are, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting for me kind of being a mum and obviously like, a huge part of my life is interacting with other mums and kids and and hearing the frustrations that come up which is almost always that the women feel like the burden of the mental load is on them mm -hmm. in managing the household and getting kids to school and remembering things that feel like a nothing thing to the men when they complain about it you know like 
I have to remember their birthdays and I have to buy the presents and I have to remember to buy the stuff for the school lunchboxes and then make the school lunchboxes. And these are all like mundane things that aren't really big. And so then when they're saying them to their partners, mm -hmm. their male partners, they're going, yeah, but I mean, you just went to the shop and made a lunchbox. It's not like a massive thing. Yeah. But as the woman, you're, it's the cumulative list of things that are adding to your mental load that give the impression that you're running like a duck with the legs yeah. underwater constantly whereas the men are very good at like doing the macro thing and then sitting back on the sofa and playing chess mm. and that can cause this kind of dissonance within the male female -male relationships within the household and it's kind of interesting to hear what you're saying and then hear what you're saying about the bees mm. as well and to see how that plays out and like how do we manage the modern world and this mm. drive towards equality and this drive towards giving female people within all areas of society more equality and then also this traditional roles that you were talking about that we fall into where women are naturally in general better at certain things and the male brain is better at yeah. certain things. Like how do we, I think that yeah. that's where a lot of confusion in society now comes from because- Equal opportunities equal has come opportunities around without an understanding of the dis, of what inequality and capabilities or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. like the structures. Or, or aptitudes. Like the structures maybe were there in society yeah. that were that were keeping us trapped and giving us less freedoms yeah. that we've been bucking against for so long. And now that we've kind of started to deconstruct them, a bit like what you were saying, we don't have a template. You know, when we're templated from little, you know, with our parents templating either in a positive or a negative way, there is a template. And within templates, you know, at the bulk of humans do really well. They're like, okay, yeah. well, this is what I have to do. I'm not my happiest self, but at least I know this is the progress. So once we take that away, and I imagine this is something, a long point, but this is where I'm getting to, when you go on an expedition, you're taking away all those templates, all those constructs and throwing people people into situations where they don't have any like obvious things mm. and like how do you do here and I'd say that's a major part of people's catharsis within that um within so, the benefit of to reimagine right? themselves, to, re -imagine themselves yeah. to allow themselves to be outside of those costs mm. yeah I think it's um I mean it's a, such a such a good point that you make and it's you know if we look at um the UK and, and the western world I suppose it's like you know we own like the suffragette movement was only like a hundred years ago. Like how much of it's incredible, really. Like how much have we achieved in a hundred years, and how far we've come. I mean, I look at my my grandmother's um, ninety five, and you know, I look at her and how her life looked in terms of you know, my grandfather decided you know when they had children, how many children they had when she when they got married. She wasn't allowed to work anymore, and yeah, you know, it's just two generations. Like you know, those patterns are still passing on. Um, you know, my mother had, you know, had the freedom to choose her work to some extent. Um, but, you know, there's still elements of that, which we've then inherited as well. And it's going to change doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time. Um, and I think there's also at the moment we've kind of got we're afraid to have these discussions because at the moment everything, you know, it's, everything's very, very sensitive. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, this the woke culture, which is, you know, uh, there, you know, there's some very good things about that, but there's also some not so good things, which means that we can't freely have these conversations which need to be had and actually be able to put our cards on the table and say, look, we've achieved so much. We're at this point now. Um, you know, we're biologically programmed <laughs> to have children. Um, you know, we do have the choice not to now, um, but, you know, there's certain necessities that, you know, that biologically we might need to tick off or it affects our mental health. But we also need to be able to have, because the modern world is now dictating this, we need to be able to have financial freedom and autonomy and, and things. And we're just not at that point yet. And to, I, sadly, I don't think we probably won't, I won't see that in my lifetime, but hopefully we'll be closer to that point, um, you know, of, of being able to have, like, to be able to share, share that. And as you were saying, it's like, you know, men and women do function differently and we need to own that and actually bring that to the table um, because equality, you know, is having the same, same rights. It doesn't mean that we have to be able to work in exactly the same way. We just need to be able to figure out <laughs> what our differences is and how we can actually integrate that much better. And yeah, I do see that on expeditions. Um, and I think a big part of that is actually just having community. Um, so many of us live very isolated lives now. Everything can be done online. 
uh, and actually bringing people together and they're on an exhibition, they're overcoming hardships together and then they're sitting around the fire at night and chatting. I mean, that's that's incredibly powerful just to bring people together and the conversations that they're, that, you know, my clients might be having that, you know, they probably wouldn't have anywhere else uh, is, you know, the, the stuff that comes up is just like blows my mind sometimes. <laughs> And tell, and tell us about you've got a really exciting expedition coming up which for me it's like the dream <laughs> expedition when I saw it online I was like hang on she's taking people to Mongolia the place I've wanted to go more in the world mm. to track essentially find snow leopards my dream animal yeah. <laughs> like tell us about how did you when you're planning an expedition firstly was it for you were you just sitting at home going I'd like to I do love Mongolia yeah. <laughs> and I love snow leopards I'll do that or how, you know, how does the planning of that stuff happen? And also tell us about how that expedition is and how if people are listening and they're kind of excited by it, what will that look like for them? Yeah, so, well, pre-COVID, uh, like for, I suppose for the past decade, really, I've been like full time with adventure filming. So setting up, finding locations for uh, coming up with a story and then running the safety of these uh, sort of large scale uh, adventure shows for like Netflix and Nat Geo and, and things. And it was just, oh, I was away 10, 11 months of the year and was so focused on that, um, that there wasn't really any space for thinking outside of that. Um, and so sort of, I suppose during COVID, it was, uh, I just really wanted to go back to sort of my expeditioning routes mm -hmm. uh, and taking people out into these markets. It's amazing just going on a journey with people and, you know, seeing their response and being part of that, that journey. Uh, so Mongolia was somewhere that I'd always wanted to go to. Uh, when I was a child, I'd read the books of Genghis Khan and <laughs> him like galloping. I've actually read them again since, and he's not such a nice person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was horrendous. <laughs> yeah. um, well, mostly his descendants, right? Um, oh, so like millions, millions of them. Bizarre. Yeah, anyway, I mean, sorry. Like, he's like the most prolific race, um, rapist in like history. <laughs> like it's just, oh, yeah, when you actually start, I went down a bit of a Google rabbit hole uh, <laughs> around Genghis Khan. Like, when I was setting up this exhibition, I was like, ooh, <laughs> this is not, this, but, is, uh, this is horrendous. <laughs> Why am I putting this person on a pedestal? But um, yeah, the, uh, the the expedition kind of, uh, it was the, I suppose, that that idea and, and how uh, vast Mongolia is and how remote it is as well. Had really kind of captured my imagination. Um, so yeah, I set up an exhibition or pre-COVID, which I'd obviously had to move and things during COVID. And then last year, um, I did an exhibition where we went and spent time living with the nomadic Kazakh people, who are the eagle masters that fly these, you know, huge um, giant golden eagles and hunt with them, uh, which is incredible. And then this year, I'm running that one again and um, running a trip to go and track snow leopards as well, because it's the second largest population of snow leopards uh, in lives in Western Mongolia. Um, so, so we're gonna go and uh, go track them. I've got a tracker that's coming with me and then the, the local peoples that we'll be working with on that as well. Because uh, I know Lydia, you, you'd, uh, you'd um, adopted a, a snow leopard, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah, so yeah, it's an amazing story really. And it's so funny because I think so a lot of the experience that I had experiences that I had when I was young because of my parents taking us to live in amazing places and my dad had this drive he was a poet he had this real drive to live in the most remote places with no electricity no running water and to do his writing and that was just my life so it didn't seem that strange at the time and it's only kind of looking back on it when you're older that you're thinking a brave <laughs> to take two young children to places yeah. like that like I'm thinking about my child now I'm going but, you know, and it's interesting because we have a lot of judgments of our parents, you know, and things that we feel like they did wrong, or, you know, or, or ways that we feel like they could have lived their life bigger or whatever. And then I look back and think, my God, like I have these preconceptions of who I think my mom or my dad are. And then actually they just went off into the actual wilderness yeah. where there was no communication. We were eight and a half hours walk from any town, you know, from any where there, where there would have been a hospital or a doctor or, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. And we were just living up a mountain, the only white people for miles and miles around, you know, and, and having to buy, my mum just had like a homeopathy book. <laughs> did, did, so what's, what's it become, uh, the difference between uh, a brave person and a fool is like whether they succeed or not, yes. essentially. <laughs> sort of succeeded. Lucky, yeah. lucky, we're still alive, well done mum. But you know, the, the experiences that I had were things like, 
you know, my nanny was a, a Nepalese guy called Raju and we used to go off on little ponies, around, like trekking through them, like mountain ponies would just be riding the mountain ponies up and then we'd take potatoes and dig a hole in the ground and make a fire, bury the potatoes, go off and catch frogs. And then an hour come back and those potatoes would be black and we'd peel the edges off and delicious. eat them warm. And, mm. and that was delicious, but it was just also normal, you know, going to say hello to everyone. And because we were seven and a half thousand feet up, there was an amazing mountain in front of us called Machu Puchari, which is the fishtail mountain. It's the sacred mountain in Nepal. And there's a kind of association with the snow leopard being the sacred animal and this mountain. And it was kind of framed by the place we lived. Every morning you could see the sun rise over it and the whole mountain would go pink. Amazing. Mm-hmm. People would come stay in the lodge and they'd get up and do yoga in front of the mountain. It was my first experience of, of yoga. And one day, one of the villagers went into the rhododendron forest and uh, a snow leopard, a female snow leopard had been tracked and killed by poachers and had left two baby snow leopards in the forest. Uh, you know, they would have died. So they came back into the village and said, like, who's going to take one of the snow leopards? And one of the other villagers took one and we took one. We had to, my mum had to teach all the staff how to sterilise bottles and we had to bottle feed it and mm-hmm. we had to um, put it in. It stepped, I had a, a rabbit, like a bunny rabbit, not real, like a teddy that I used to sleep with. And we put it in a little cardboard box to sleep next to the rabbit so that it felt like it had its mum there and we would bottle feed it all the time. And and it was such an amazing thing to look back on now. Go, there was a time when we had a snow leopard as a pet. And you know, it didn't unfortunately we had to we only lived there for seven months of the year when we went away the bottles weren't sterilized as well as maybe oh. they could have been and and it didn't it didn't live. Um, but actually when I was thinking about it going we never thought through the end point yeah, of that. like we were like we'll take this snow leopard <laughs> I'm, d- so I'm done with milk now oh humans cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what would have happened I don't know what they were thinking because it wasn't like we were somewhere where you could like send them to a zoo to be looked after and you couldn't exactly have humanized them got them used to humans because we had to have guards at every night mm. to protect us you know standing at the edge of, of our lodge from the snow leopards and then suddenly there's one inside <laughs> You got it. So I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting to think through the end of that, but it's always held this fascination for me because the other amazing thing about it is in Nepal, because they believe it's a sacred creature, they think that you shouldn't photograph it because it's it's really sacred. And not many people would have had photography tools, really, in fairness, back when we were living there. But we did photograph it. And when we developed those films, when we went back to England, where the snow leopard was, was just a flash of light. No way. Never came out in any of the films. No way. Not a single photo. Jesus. Which is, I, I can't explain wow. it. I know it sounds funky, but it's kind of fascinating. I wondered in, in Mongolia, do they have that? Are the snow leopards also sacred in that same way? Yes, yeah, they are. It's like, you know, similar to Nepal, it's like the ghost of the mountain. It's definitely that, yeah, that connection um, with them. But then at the same time, they're coming under threat as well because they are hunting domestic livestock um, and are, are now endangered. Uh, but yeah I think they they are I think in Nepal where they've because I know there's some um uh arguments about them again uh is that they they protected them um, and they were growing in numbers and then starting to you know come down and take the livestock again um so yeah it's that kind of are they they're are they an apex predator do they have any predators uh no other than humans no yeah, yeah so yeah but I is it a little bit like like there's this reintroduction of wolves going on as well where everyone's kind of like Okay, cool. But like where wolves go, nothing eats them and they breed pretty prolifically. Is it the same? Is it a similar danger with, with imagine like, or uh, sorry, with developers? Yeah, just, just to some extent. Yes. I mean, if there isn't, it, I guess, depends on their food populations of what they're eating and, and things as well. Um, and they tend to hunt in quite difficult places. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the wolves. We're are start to give them, sorry. Yeah. But then if you, you know, if you, I don't know if you've watched any of the documentaries around Yellowstone and the wolves there and the effect that the Yellowstone wolves have had on the entire uh, climate and environment there is just is incredible um, because of them. And like then that then has a knock on effect on their the behavior of their prey, which means that there's more grasses growing elsewhere, which brings other animals. So it's just like, um, yeah, it's incredible. So I, I don't necessarily know the ins and outs of how the snow leopard affects the snow, the um, the food chain and everything there and nature, but I'd imagine it probably kind of quite similar. Right. And where, where will you guys be staying when you're on this trek? Like how rustic, rudimentary, four star <laughs> is it? <laughs> Um, so there's yeah so there's no uh, there's no like buildings or anything out there. Um, it's staying in. Uh, we'll either be staying with uh, some of the local nomads in their gurs, which are like yeah like structures, um, 
or we've got our own tents that come along with us, which have got like, because at that time of year, September, it can be really, really cold. We can get all four seasons in a day, but we've got nice um, log burners, like wood burners in these. Well, we actually burn poo, but um, yeah, dried, dried poo in these <laughs> things. <laughs> but it's not, they're nice and toasty and it doesn't smell. Uh, there's nice, it's, uh, it's nice and toasty in those uh, at night. Um, and uh, so yeah, we have that and then we have a, have a cook tent as well. So um, those things kind of will come with us um, while, we're, while we're on the journey. And we do walk or ride on horses? Um, so it's a mix. So we've got we've got four by fours to, to get in there. Um, and then we've got horses. So we're on horse and foot. Okay. And how do you work with the local population so that it doesn't feel like you're just coming in and like bringing all these Westerners into this society that's got this really, you know, basic structure in terms of it hasn't been corrupted that much? How do you manage that so that you feel like you are responsibly being part of the landscape rather than feeling like Westerners who are just like arriving to be voyeurs? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously it's always it's always very difficult because, you know, we do look very different. Um, and the areas that I, I try to go to are less touristy. So these ones in Mongolia, it's like love, when we were there this last year, um, uh, we saw maybe four other Westerners there. Uh, and I, I was out there for two months um which is amazing but um yeah for me it's really important that we work very closely with the locals so i i wherever i go um i I'll always work with a local team so we're bringing money into the economy um and supporting them and um as we go through interacting as much as possible um with the locals and what i try to encourage as much as possible on the trips is that you know we're not there to be looked after my clients will get involved in like the cooking and things where they're learning traditional skills and you know with the horses and things at night it's like you know you look after the horse before you look after yourself and you know, get into your tent and things cool That's and can anyone apply or do you have to be someone who has a level of either physicality or survival training or you know other requirements um so these ones are like a, just a, like an above average level of fitness so kind of able to uh kind of hike around for six to eight hours uh a day it's not like it's not massively far distances that we'll be covering but um it's yeah just it's just for comfort um and also to spend time in the saddle you don't need to be an expert horse rider like i'm certainly not <laughs> um so it's not really about the technicality of horse riding it's about spending time in the saddle because uh, it, it, like long hours in in riding can be incredibly uncomfortable, particularly with the their their Western style saddles. So it's like you're not rising to the trot either. So you're kind of being bounced around in the in the saddles. It can be quite uncomfortable. Serious on the bum. Serious. Oh my god. Yes, yes. Get that get that bum toned a bit. <laughs> or <Also laughs> padding on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That. Yeah, untoned actually be useful. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and so how can people, if they want to sign up to that or they want to look into it, how can they, where's the best place for them to go? Um, so if you want to find out more about it, uh, it's on my website, uh, which is meganhine.com, um, H-I-N-E. Uh, dot com or uh, through Instagram is a good way to, to be in touch because I love to see what you guys are up to as well. Uh, and that's Megan underscore Hine. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Uh, Megan, so many more so questions. Many more questions. <laughs> oh, we gotta let you go. Well, yeah, we have to let you go, but yeah. maybe we can have in mind a part two. Please. <laughs> Oh, that'd be awesome. It'd be really good because these, these questions, you know, the the way that like the expeditions and the natural world and things ties into you know mindfulness and mental health is like is so powerful. Mm. For us, I mean, our, our obviously our our work is called wandering into wellness so, precisely yeah. because of that because we really found the benefit of nature as a remedy essentially. Nature right? as a remedy and and us coming back to that understanding that we aren't separate from nature, we are nature, and it's kind of such a huge part of what we're teaching and it. You know, there's so many similarities in listening to your TED talk and listening to your book and things that you're saying um, that we're telling our clients all the time. But I think it's probably a lot less powerful coming from us when yes. we haven't like survived in Mongolia. <laughs> or the the and it'd be really nice to combine those, mm. combine those things to, you know, what are the techniques that we're using day to day with people and what are ones you're finding out work for you in those survival things. Yeah. And I think that would be a really Different nice times, marriage. Wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, that, that'd be amazing. Yeah, so um, last, well, few years, just for pre-COVID, um, we were work, myself and uh, a friend of mine, we've been working on anti-poaching 
courses. They, they, there's, well, there's an organization that runs kind of six month training programs for rangers where the rangers are like learning to be able to train other rangers up. Uh, and the, one of the things that we were involved with with that was um, resilience training and actually working with these you know, incredible men and women are putting their lives on the line uh they're like some of them are coming under you know getting involved in firefights like on a weekly basis and it was like dealing with fear and anxiety because they don't have the resources to be able to deal with ptsd and things so it's like well how do we equip them um and prevention is always you know better than cure uh and uh, through doing that and setting up these courses we actually kind of looked at now how we can bring that into into like the corporate world and, and things as well and it, everyday life because they it was so effective Amazing. Amazing. Really amazing well we're definitely let's do another one we talk specifically about that that'd be, that'd be really great yeah yeah important actually be. yeah like a workshop thing cool yeah, exactly all right megan thank you thank you so much and just want to say thank you so much for everyone for watching and listening and thanks so much to our sponsors clear light saunas to bring infrared light into your day which means getting outside and the first and the last hours of the day which is something that all traditional cultures knew that was important we've really lost it if you don't have access to it in a city like me it's a bit built up get yourself an infrared sauna come and talk to us we'll get you a discount on a fully emf uh free infrared sauna and yeah finally just thanks so much megan i've learned so much and i literally i've, I've, I've hours of questions and he definitely wants to go on the mongolian yes. trip yeah yeah, no, yeah i'm trying to not <laughs> say it <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs>